champions! How are all of you doing? I hope you are doing great just like I am. Now, talking about today's chapter, I'm pretty sure that all of you must have heard about the term parliament. But have you thought about why we need a parliament in the first place? So, in today's session, I am sure that you will get an answer to all your doubts. So, let's get started. Now, first of all, let's take a look at the topics that we are going to be covering today in this particular chapter. We will be talking about people and their representatives. Then we will go ahead and discuss the role or the function of the parliament. And then we will go ahead and talk about the people in the parliament. So, let us begin this session with the first subtopic, which is people and their representatives. So, for that, let's start by understanding what is meant by the term democracy. And then we will further understand how people elect their representatives. Now, I'm sure that you know that India is the largest democratic country in the world. Now, do you know what the population of India is? Mm, well, let me tell you, it's very interesting. India has a population of more than 130 crore people. Isn't that a considerable number? Yes, it is. And with such a large population, obviously, it's not feasible for all of these people to come together and make decisions on every other issue, right? And that is why in a democracy, people rule through elected representatives. Let me put this down for you. Right? They rule through elected representatives. Now, these uh, elected representatives are basically elected by the people themselves. Right? And these, are, these elected representatives then make decisions on behalf of the people. So, let us go ahead and let us understand or study what a democracy is. So, basically, very simply, I've already explained a little bit of this before. A democracy is a form of government that simply stands for of the people, by the people and for the people. You see how this beautifully connects to what we talked about before. It is of the people, by the people and for the people, which means that we ourselves are choosing our representatives and these representatives are making decisions on behalf of us and for us. Now, you know that before India got its independence on 15th August 1947, we were under colonial rule. And at that point in time, we had no freedom. So at that time, the rules were made by the British government. And just in case someone objected to these rules, they faced severe consequences. So it wasn't a very great situation. So in 1885, the Indian National Congress, they demanded that the members of its party should be elected to the legislature. They also wanted to have the right to discuss the budget and ask questions, right? So, this demand forced the British government to constitute the Government of India Act of 1909. Now, this is a very important date. The Government of India Act of 1909, which then allowed some members to be elected. Right. So, we had representation by Indian members. However, there was a catch to it. These elected members were not allowed to vote or participate in any sort of decision making, right? So this again is not a great situation at all. Now tell me, does this sort of thing continue post-independence? No. The constitution of India after independence gave the people the power to choose their representatives and these elected representatives do participate in decision making now, right? So this is quite a big change for us. So we choose our representatives by voting and this is done through the system of universal adult franchise. But what exactly is universal adult franchise? So it simply means that the right to vote should be given to all adult citizens above 18 years of age. So above 18 years of age, they have the right to vote and this is done without uh, discrimination of caste, class, color, religion or gender. I'm just marking it for you. All Indian citizens above the age of 18 have the right to vote regardless of caste, religion or gender. Right? Okay. Now moving on. Let me ask you a question. 
what do you mean uh, or what do you understand by the term consent or approval? So, the word or the term consent basically means to give permission or to agree to something. Now, in a democratic country, the citizens are the most important people. They are the ones who create a democratic government. But how do the people give approval or consent to the government? Yes, this happens through elections, through voting. People vote during elections and they elect their own representatives. Then these elected representatives, they form the government. And then this government makes laws and policies for the welfare of the uh, citizens, basically. So in fact, talking about welfare, um, le le let's take the example of the COVID-19 um, vaccination drive, right? Now, this drive was launched by the government of India to vaccinate all its citizens because it is the government who is responsible for our well-being, right? So, they are making decisions for us, on behalf of us, right? Now, we have spoken about elections. But do you know which commission is responsible for conducting elections? Well, it is the Election Commission of India. Now, this commission is established by the Constitution of India to ensure that we have free and fair elections in the country. And do you know that no matter how difficult the terrain is, we have election officers who actually reach to those difficult and rough terrains and they set up polling booths over there. In fact, this reminds me of a particular instance. How many of you know of or have heard of the Gir Forest? You've heard of it? Do, do you know uh, what state the Gir Forest is located in? Well, let me tell you. The Gir Forest is located in Gujarat. And do you know that there is this um, Shiva temple which is present in the Gir Forest? And you have in this temple, you have one priest who lives over there. Now, for this one priest, the election office, office officials, they travel all the way there. They set up a polling booth in the Gir forest so that this one single person can cast his vote. And this shows truly wonderfully how important people are in a democracy. You see, each and every vote matters, right? Okay. With that, let's move on to our next topic, which is the role or the function of the parliament. Now, first of all, do you know where the parliament is located? Well, the parliament is located in New Delhi. I'm sure you know that, right? Now, let's learn more about the parliament. But before we actually learn more about the parliament, let me ask you a question, which is a very logical question before we learn about the role about more about it or the role of the function. What exactly is a parliament in the first place? Well, the parliament is considered as the representative of the people, right? And the members of the parliament are selected through elections and they become part of the Lok Sabha, right? So they are elected basically through elections, selected or elected, and then they become part of the Lok Sabha. So the people that we vote for directly become a part of the Lok Sabha, which is a part of the parliament. Now, India is divided into several constituencies and each constituency elects one member to the parliament. These elected members are called members of parliament or MPs. Now, we've understood this, let us take a look at the functions of the parliament. But uh, b again, before understanding the functions, let's understand or before that, uh, let me tell you who the parliament is made up of. So I briefly mentioned it when I was talking to you about the Lok Sabha before. Basically, the parliament consists of the president, the Lok Sabha as well as the Rajya Sabha. And the government at the national level is elected from the Lok Sabha. So, the government at the national level. It is elected from the Lok Sabha. Right? You'll understand this a little bit more. So, basically, members of the Lok Sabha are usually elected every, uh, every once in five years. Uh, once in every five years. We vote for them once in every five years. So what does this imply? That they basically have all the MPs uh, serve a tenure of five years. Now, 
Can you tell me? Do you know what the total strength of the Lok Sabha is? So, the total strength of the Lok Sabha is 543 members who are elected uh, by the people, that is by us through general elections, right? Now, earlier on, this is not happening currently, but let me tell you what was happening earlier on. Earlier on, you had 545. 543 were elected by us and two used to be nominated from the Anglo-Indian community by the President of India. However, now we don't have the system anymore. The provision of the nomination of Anglo-Indians is not relevant anymore, right? So now we have 543 members. Now, one of the most important functions of the Lok Sabha is to select the executive, right? The executive is selected from the Lok Sabha. Do you know what an executive is? Well, let me tell you, I'm here for that. So, the executive is a group of MPs that basically implement law and order made by the parliament and the executive is headed by the PM or the Prime Minister. Right? Now, once the MPs are elected, then the MPs of each political party are counted and this is done to set up a government. So basically for a political party to form the government, this party must have a majority of elected MPs. So uh, to attain a majority, we know that in the Lok Sabha we have 543 seats. So obviously then to form a government, a political party will need at a minimum 272 members or more, right? So the party with the majority is then called the ruling party. And then the ruling party, uh, the leader of the ruling party becomes the Prime Minister of India, right? Then the Prime Minister selects their executive from the MPs who belong to the ruling party. These ministers then take charge of different departments of the government functioning like, for example, health, education, finance and so much more. Now, let me ask you a question. Is it always necessary that a single political party wins the majority and forms the government? No, sometimes it might happen that no political party wins majority seats. That is more than 272 seats, 272 seats or more. So in such cases, what happens? In such cases, two or more parties come together and form a coalition government. So a coalition government is basically the joining of two or more parties who then form the government, right? Now, we spoke about the ruling party. But apart from the ruling party, the rest of the members in the Lok Sabha, they form the opposition in the parliament. Now, the largest party among these is called the opposition party, right? Okay, so we've now discussed the Lok Sabha. Now, let us talk about the Rajya Sabha, which is also a very important part of the parliament, right? So, we discussed that members of the Lok Sabha are elected by us through elections. But what about the members of the Rajya Sabha? Hmm, how are they elected? <laughs> Let me tell you. So, members of the Rajya Sabha are elected indirectly by us because they are elected by the legislative assemblies of each state. Let me put this down. Legislative assemblies of each state. So basically you have the legislative assembly of each state that goes ahead and um, elects the members of the Rajya Sabha and we know that the legislative assembly of each state has been elected by us, right? So basically the legislative assembly of the states as well as the union territories, right? Now, the members of the Rajya Sabha are elected for a tenure of six years, right? So uh, Lok Sabha, just to clarify, is direct election whereas Rajya Sabha is indirect election by us, right? Okay. Now, the Rajya Sabha has representatives of states in parliament. So naturally you would have bigger states like Uttar Pradesh or Maharashtra or Karnataka which would have more members. And then smaller states like Goa, Uttarakhand and uh, maybe even Sikkim, Sikkim who have lesser number of members. Now, let's talk about the total strength of the Rajya Sabha. The total strength of the Rajya Sabha is 245 members, out of which 233 are elected by the Legislative Assembly members like we spoke about, right? But out of this 245, 
12 are nominated by the President of India and they are nominated for their contribution to various fields like art, literature, science, social science, right? So that basically makes up the entire 245. Now, we've spoken about how they've been elected. But do you know the functions of the Rajya Sabha? Well, one of the important functions of Rajya Sabha is actually to pass a bill. Right. So basically, once a bill is passed through the Lok Sabha, what happens? This bill is then sent to the Rajya Sabha for its consent. Right? So a bill has to be passed through the Rajya Sabha for it to actually become a law. And this is how, this is the function of the Rajya Sabha. It's very, very important. So it goes to the Rajya Sabha. Then the Rajya Sabha reviews it, alters it. Uh, and then laws are initiated in the Lok Sabha. Okay? All right. Now, let us go ahead and talk about the next function of the parliament, which is basically to control, guide and inform the government. So, the parliament, while it is in session, begins with a very interesting hour called the question hour. This is so interesting because it is at this time that the members of parliament can ask questions about the working of the government. Now, this is so important because in, it is in this way actually that the government can be controlled. Right. So basically, by asking questions, the government is then alerted to its shortcomings and they are made aware of the opinion of the people through their representatives in the parliament. Right. So this is how it functions. Right. So in this case, talking about question hour, the opposition party actually plays a very big role or a major role in ensuring the government uh, ensuring that the government works properly through question hour, right? It's a way of controlling them. And in fact, apart from all this, all matters related to finance need approval from the parliament and are very crucial uh, for the government. So the government gets a lot of valuable feedback and is really kept on its toes by the questions asked by the members of parliament. So this is very, very important, right? And I think it's very necessary also, right? Now, talking about the process of lawmaking, the process of lawmaking begins with the introduction of a bill in either of the houses of parliament. So it could be in the Lok Sabha, it could be in the Rajya Sabha. A bill undergoes three readings in each house before it is submitted to the president for their assent. Now, I'm not going to get into this in too much detail right now. We will be studying uh, more about this in the coming chapters, right? For all, now you all only need to know it can be initiated in either house. It goes through three readings and then it is given to the president for the president, president to actually pass it. Now, with that, let us move ahead and talk about our last and next topic, which is the people in the parliament. But before that, can you quickly think uh, or call out to yourself maybe think about basically the state that you are that you are in or the state that you belong to <laughs> well i am sure that everyone watching here at this point in time is giving different names right some will say maharashtra some will say uttarakhand some will say sikkim different 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 places so just like the way that all of you are from different states the parliament also has people or representatives from different states and backgrounds in fact not only different states, the parliament also has uh, some seats which are reserved for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Isn't that good? Because then we have adequate representation over here. So basically this ensures that these classes, namely the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, they have adequate representation in the parliament, right? So nobody feels left out. Now, in fact, uh, if, you, if you think about this step that has been taken, this step has actually helped in increasing political participation from the backward classes too, from the minorities too, right? And in fact, not just the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe, recently it's very very, it's, it's very powerful and it's very interesting, it's coming up, is it has also recently been suggested that seats should be reserved for women also. Why? Well, because if you think about it, uh, though nearly half the population in India are women, only 11% of MPs are actually women, right? So they're, they're not very well represented. They, so the amount of women are actually very less considering how much of population of women we have. 
So reservations for women would actually be a great step to encourage them to contest elections as well as become a part of the parliament. Right, so with that, we have come to the end of today's session. Let's quickly do a recap of what we learned today. So we learned what a democracy is. Right? And we learned how important it is for, a pe for the people in a democracy to rule through their elected representatives, right? Basically, decisions are taken on behalf of us. We also learned that these representatives are elected by the people, right? Like I said, the decisions uh, are made on behalf of the people. Moving on, we also learned about various roles in the parliament or we basically spoke about the functions of the parliament which were very, very important. We learned about the Lok Sabha, we learned about the Rajya Sabha and we learned about their independent functions also. And not just that, we also learned about the people in the parliament, we learned about reservations given to scheduled castes as well as scheduled tribes. Right, so we've ended here. Just in case you have any doubts, please do not hesitate to ask me or to let me know in the comment section below. We will do our best to answer these doubts, right? And before I go, let me quickly remind you once again, have you registered for Anthe, which is the Akash National Talent Hunt exam? If you haven't done it, please do this now. This is a great opportunity for various, various reasons. Go ahead and do it now as well as make use of the opportunity that we have for you, which is the Baiju's mini learning program. You know that in the, uh, the Baiju's mini learning program is a great program and act actually and we are offering it you know, free for the first 500 users every week. All you need to do is click on the link in the description box and type in the code YT first, right? And then you will avail of this absolutely free. But you've got to hurry up. It's only free for the first 500 users every week. And for more such sessions by me and other fantastic teachers at Baiju's, definitely tune into our Baiju 6 to 8th channel. Go ahead, review the videos that we've put up for you, especially during your uh, midterms or your exams, or even if not, it's really great revision. And do not forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Bye-bye.